So we're going to spend the next 30 minutes talking about something called Git Workflow. And we're going to go through a series of examples as we do that. And one of the final ones that we'll come across is the, the Git Workflow that we're presently using on Flash 5. And so before I talk, uh, I want to thank the people that I've been collaborating with as we try to design and arrive at the current workflow that we have. So that's Anshu, Klaus, Sarv, and Carlo. And uh, I also have a collaborator, a colleague at, uh, at Argon, who's always been very kind with me, and he's been very willing to discuss the different Git workflows that he uses on his different projects, what he does and doesn't like about those. So that's uh, Julian here. And I want to thank him as well. So when I think about the term Git flow, what I'm imagining is a team of developers who are working together on some piece of software that they want to develop or maintain or just improve. And they've made the common sense decision to try to locate that and use that software within a version control system. But they realize that they need some help they need some policies and some rules that they want to implement so that they can, as they work together, as they're developing their code in parallel, when they integrate that code and they collaborate through putting the code into the version control system, they want that to be easy, they want to be productive in doing that, and they also want to know that the code end, that ends up in the repository is also correct. So that's what we mean by a Git workflow. And the way that we're going to look at this is by trying to consider the extra dimensions that exist in certain version control systems and see how we can best use those to meet our goals. And so one of those uh, extra dimensions would be really leveraging the notion of local versus remote repositories. Another dimension is branches. And a third dimension is what we were just listening to about if, you know, if you're using a version control host like GitHub, you have access to issues, pull requests, and code reviews. And you can try to work those into your workflow as well. So I'm not going to talk too much about that, uh, that part of, uh, of or that extra dimension as we go through this. So if you're already familiar with workflows or you're getting bored as we go through these different examples, you can feel free to try to figure out how you could use, best use those to, to help your team. So the idea of this is not that you walk away with here by being able to take one of these workflow examples and be able to apply it to all of your projects. That's probably just not going to happen. Rather, what we're going to do is ramp through uh, different uh, workflows of different complexity and try to ask ourselves questions what we do and don't like about that. So ideally, once you've done, you're done listening to this, when you try to design a workflow or you come across one and you want to evaluate it for whether or not it will work with your project, hopefully you will have a good idea of how you might want to proceed with that. Um, and then lastly, this will ramp up into continuous integration, which I'll be talking about a little bit after the break. So we're going to jump in with our first example. So there's this new software project that's just starting. We have two members coming in, uh, Alice and Bob. And they're going to be collaborating and developing in parallel using Git. And when they start this project, someone's already put some code into some remote repository called Origin in the forms of three commits, A, B, and C. And so Alice is sitting in some part of the world, and she goes to her laptop, and she's going to use Git to connect to that remote repository to issue a clone command. And Git's going to take that remote repository and put a full copy of it onto her laptop so that she now has her own version of that repository, her own local repository in her laptop. And Bob's sitting in some someplace else in the world, and he does the exact same thing. He sits at his laptop. He issues this clone command, and he's going to end up with his own local repository on his laptop. So at this point in time, we now have three different repositories. And they're all synchronized in the sense that they all have commits A, B, and C. But Bob and Alice are both eager. And so they immediately start doing work. So Bob does work in the forms of commits E, H, and J. And Alice does work in the forms of commit D, F, G, and I. And they're both happy. They're both being productive. Each one is working within that little microcosm of their local repository. And everything seems to be going great. But that's not the point of their collaboration, is it? They need to actually take that code and share it. So Alice sees what she's doing, but not what Bob's doing, and vice versa. And no one in the rest of the world knows that these two have even done any work. So they need to take that work from their local repositories and push it and share it with the, with the rest of the world in that remote repository, which means this is where they're going to have to integrate their work. And how do they go about doing that? So when you do this type of integration, there tends to be sort of race conditions that happen. And so for, the, you know, for this example, we're going to, what we're going to imagine is that Alice is the first person who tries to integrate her work by pushing it to that remote repository. So she wins the race condition. This is very easy. It's very simple. And there's no risk associated with it. Her Git is just going to take those four commits that she has and send them to the remote repository, and they're just going to get appended to that master branch in the remote repository. So now her local repository and this remote 
are both synchronized again, and she's integrated her work. Bob, however, is still sitting in this place where he has his work, but he doesn't know what Alice has done. And so he's lost out on this race condition. And to make this example a little bit more interesting, we're going to imagine that at some commit C, someone created this file loops.cpp and put in some to-do statements saying, please code up these very important loops. And both of these two, they're new to the project. They hadn't really ironed out their communication issues. So they both sit down and they write those same loops, but in slightly different ways, of course. And so when Bob tries to push his work to that remote repository, Git is going to sense that, uh, that conflict and throw up his hands and say, you fix this. And so Bob's going to have to sit down and look at his version of loops.cpp to study it. He's going to have to sit down and look at Alice's version and study it, try to figure out why they're different and how to resolve that conflict between these this conflicting lines of work. He might also have to sit down and have conversations with Alice to try to figure out the best way to do this. So this is, of course, time consuming. It's frustrating. And it leads to the risk of, of really increasing, uh, injecting bugs into the system. So it's something we would try to, try to avoid. So at this point now, we've got through our first workflow. And this might be something that could be categorized as a centralized workflow. And I've put a link there if you want more information about uh, centralized workflows and another example. In terms of all the workflows that we're going to see, this is the simplest to learn, the easiest to use. Uh, of course, I put those in quotes because if you're new to Git, or more, and more specifically, if you're new to collaborating with many different people through Git, this is still going to be a little bit challenging at the beginning, right? So what do we like about it? Well, we really are leveraging that local versus remote repository. These two people were working in parallel. They were happy in their own, the world of their little isolated world of their local repositories. And the only time that they had difficulties was when they were synchronizing their local repositories with the remote repositories, right? So that's great. And now we can start to ask ourselves questions. How does this scale up with team size, for instance? So it was just Alice and Bob, it probably wasn't too bad. But if I'm on a team of 10 people, and I try to push my results to that remote repository, I might find out that I now have conflicts with not just Alice, but with actually 10 people. And that's going to be really hard for me to try to resolve that. It's not going to be fun. It's certainly not going to be productive, right? So this simple of a workflow really might not scale very well. We can also imagine what happens if I'm on a team of five people, and four of those people like to synchronize on a daily basis, but one person insists on only doing it on, let's say, once a month. Well, if that person has done a month's, a month's amount of work and they're getting ready to push it, we can understand that the contents that are in their remote repository and that particular person's repositories will have diverged significantly. So when they try to push it, there's going to be a very high risk of conflicts and they're probably going to be riskier to resolve as well. We can go to the other end and see, you know, when can we pull this off? So if I'm on a team of 10 people and we manage to divide up the work so that we know that at no point in time are two people going to be working on the same file, well, then we know that there's no risk whatsoever of conflicts. And we can get away with using just this simple of a workflow. Uh, I want to point out, though, that at this point in time, all of these commits are being made on this master branch, right? And one of the realities of working is that every now and then, either without, you know, by explicitly or accidentally, we're going to end up creating commits on these branches that are broken. And so when people come to our repository and they want to use our software to do science or engineering, we have to have some way to communicate to them which one of these commits is actually trustworthy and which ones aren't. So there's a great number of ways that we can do that. And what we're going to try to do in this particular case is, is to augment our workflows to help us isolate it so that hopefully all those commits on the master branch are all trustworthy. That's what we're really shooting for here. So we're going to add on the next layer here of branches. And for, you know, for what we're talking about here, branches are just independent lines of development. And we're going to use these branches to help us uh, isolate the master branch a little bit from some of the dirtier work that we're doing. And what we're going to concentrate on these things called feature branches. So the idea is I've got some bit of work that I want to do on the software. And this is bit of work that I'm going to do is going to come into existence through a series of related commits. And instead of just putting those on the master branch, I'm going to put them aside on this feature branch. And once I finish that development, I think the feature is good. Now I'm going to merge those commits from the feature branch into the master branch. And that's where the integration is happening. So we've got here a series of simple graphics to look what that merge, to, to get an idea what that merging might look like. So in this case, someone created a feature A branch. They based it off of the latest commit on master, which was C. And they did two commits worth of work, right? 
I've drawn that in this dog leg sense so that we get this idea that these are two distinct branches, but in reality, this is just a simple linear history of development. So when we do the merge, we're just going to essentially be flattening that out. We're just going to take those two commits and append them to the end of, of the master branch. So this is really a simple situation. This is the greatest situation that we can come across. And excuse me, this is called a fast forward situation and a fast forward merge. And then if we look down here in the lower left, what we see is a different situation where, again, that same feature branch with two commits of work based off of A, but in parallel we see that someone else did some other work in terms of commit C, and they put that on the master branch. So now we're not in a fast forward situation. Git, when it tries to combine these two lines of work, are going to have to figure out uh, how to mix B, C, and D together and to try to identify if there are any conflicts. If they are, when we do that merge, it's going to tell us that there are those conflicts and that we need to resolve them. Once we're done, it takes that, in, that, that mixed work of B, C, and D and it creates this merge commit on the master branch in the form of E. So that's where our integration is happening. That's where those conflicts are coming out and where the risk can pop up. So branches are great. Um, they can do a lot for us. And as we, I think, is, we'll commonly find is Git is a very powerful tool and we can use it in really creative ways. And so what can happen is if we allow everyone to use this with sort of maximal creativity, we might end up with some very complex situations. That complexity is not necessarily bad, but sometimes complexity can get a little bit out of hand and it can start to become counterproductive. So what we might want to do when we're coming up with a workflow is find ways to rein in that complexity a little bit by placing some rules on how we use branches. So a good thing about version control system is we oftentimes get implicit communication from this. So if I allow people to just have branch names like A, B, and stuff, I'm really missing out on the opportunity of that implicit communication. So one simple rule will say, have descriptive names, right? We can ask ourselves, do we want people to be able to start and end branches wherever they want to? Like here, someone put A off of B and then merged into stuff. Is that acceptable? Do we want to have multiple people working on a single branch? Or does that start to make our lives very complicated when things go wrong? So for instance, let's imagine that this is one developer on A, and they see that stuff might, might benefit from the work that they've done. You can imagine that if they just go ahead and merge in A to stuff, someone, another developer's branch, without asking for permission, that might cause both technical and social issues. And maybe we want some rules to try to prevent those sort of fights from popping up. So we're going to take that centralized workflow and now uh, augment it by adding on these feature branches. So again, we're back to Alice and Bob. At some point, there's just commits A and B in the remote repository, and Bob synchronizes. And he creates this feature branch, issue 151, off of B and does some work. And then another commit C pops up in the remote repository. Alice synchronizes there and makes her add solver A feature branch off of C. And again, they're both happy because they're in their, in their local repositories. Everything looks wonderful. They're both in that lovely fast forward situation. Back to the race condition, Alice is first, so she does that flattening out. She does that, uh, that fast forward merge in her local repository and then pushes the, the results across to remote repository. Everything's happy. And we're going to imagine again that there's conflicts between Alice and Bob on these two different commits. And so now Bob is sitting in his local repository and before he tries to push his his work across, he'll check out that master branch and he'll do a pull from the remote repository to see if it's changed while he's been busy. And lo and behold, he finds all that work that Alice has done and he suddenly realizes he's no longer in the fast forward situation and he's quite sad. And he's going to try to figure out what in the world he can do to get him out of this lamentable situation. And so he's going to try to use this magical command called a rebase. And what he's going to do with that rebase is just take his feature branch, which is currently based off of B, and have Git slide it down so that magically it's, it's now going to be based off of the latest commit and master, which is I. But that's not for free. When it does that, Git's going to have to mix the work that he's done on his feature branch along with the work that Alice had already done. And that's why, for instance, we see that there are now no longer E, H, and J, but E prime, H prime, and J prime. And so this is where that integration is happening. When, that conf when Git discovers that conflict during the rebase, it's going to bring his attention to this and he's going to have to work with Alice again to try to resolve that. But this is a fairly good situation because once the rebase is finished, he can go and check out his, his new commit J prime and do whatever testing he needs to to try to confirm that his feature branch was not broken during that rebasing and he hasn't, also bro he hasn't either broken the, the work that Alice had done either. 
So that's great, and it's all happening within the world of his local repository. Once he's figured out that everything's great, he does that fast forward merge and pushes it to the remote repository. So what do we like about this feature branch scenario? One of the things is we just like branches because they're a better reflection of how it is that we work. I think the majority of, our, of us are never working on one single issue. So we're able to put every single task that we're presently working on in its own feature branch. So that is really quite nice. Another thing that's good about this is if I'm both a developer and a user, I can go and start developing the code and breaking it potentially on a feature branch. But if I need to stop that and actually do some work in the forms of science or engineering, I can go back to the master branch, check out the latest additions, and run my science and engineering off of that more trustworthy software. Um, some other things that we like is that uh, rebase was happening all within the local repository and it can be an aborted. So if the rebase starts to really go horribly, we can just stop, regroup, and redo that rebasing hopefully successfully. And as I said, everything's happening local before we touch the remote repository. Some things that might not be great is this rebase command. I don't know if it's really advanced, but it's a little bit more intermediate. So if you're on a project or a team where you have a lot of people coming in who aren't familiar with Git, this might, you know, really put under the process a higher barrier for them to becoming protective, productive means members of the team. And rebase has its issues. You have to use it carefully. There are some complications that you can cause. And I put a link here to a discussion about how you should and shouldn't use rebase, for instance. Um, other things we don't like about it is oftentimes it's hiding the actual workflow. So if you think back in the remote repository, all we had was a single branch of development, which had nothing to do at whatsoever with how we were actually developing. For some people, that's uh, an information loss. They want to be able to see the reality of how the software was developed. Um, some other things, for instance, again, is if we're all just working in our own laptops and always just doing everything in our local repositories and we're not pushing it that often, then we're missing that, uh, that chance to communicate through the version control system. Um, again, we can go through and ask ourselves these sorts of questions. And I want to point out that we haven't actually um, satisfied our goal of only having good commits on the master branch. The way we're doing these merges through this fast forward merges, every broken commit that was on a feature branch ends up being in the master branch as well. So we can try to do a little bit better. So what we're going to do is now introduce a second type of branch called the infinite lifetime branch. So these are branches that we just create off of some commit on master and we just keep committing, to, uh, committing on them as we see fit. We're never going to delete those branches and we're never going to terminally merge those into another branch. So for instance, we have things like master and development here. And what these infinite lifetime branches give us is an actual environment where we're expressing that all of the commits on this branch or in this environment have something in common. So for instance, if I have a development infinite lifetime branch, what I'm expressing is that every commit that's on this branch is someone playing around, prototyping. These commits can very easily be broken and they could also contain code that's eventually abandoned and should never end up in the software. Whereas if I have an infinite lifetime branch called pre-production, what I'm expressing is that this is code that's somewhat mature it might not be there yet, but it's somewhat mature. And what's more, I expect that this should actually go into the master branch. I think it's good and useful, right? So now we get up to the current Flash 5 workflow. And we, have, you know, we started off actually with a centralized workflow. We were able to get away with that when the team was still fairly small. But we started to add on more and more complexity. And we started to come up with a workflow that's really heavily test driven. We tried to, uh, to, to use the fact that we have a nice test suite in, uh, bundled up with the software in the repository. So what we have is three infinite lifetime branches in the form of master, staged, and development. And we say that all of the work done in adding or updating the software should be done on these feature branches. What's more, every single feature branch should both end and start on the master branch. And when you're done with your feature work and you're ready to get it into master branch, we're going to insist that the first thing that you do is you merge into this development branch. And once you're on that development branch, you do some sort of manual testing to convince yourself that what you've done is correct and you haven't broken anything obvious, right? Once you've convinced yourself of that and you do believe that, the, that the, these changes should go into the master branch, you issue a pull request into staged. Someone, you might do, trigger a code review there, what have you. Once it gets into the staged, uh, the staged branch, we have an automatic nightly test that runs on that. And so if in the morning all of those tests have passed, then we're fairly, fairly certain that what you've done is really good. It's playing well with everything in the software and we'll merge it into the master branch. So we can go through this example again here, this race condition. We have two developers on their own, their different feature branches. Dev one wins, they get into development, then stage, and then master. 
dev2 loses out. And as drawn here, we see that they, they merge into development. And this is now the first point where those dev1 and dev2 branches are getting mixed. So we're doing the integration, right? That integration is happening on this development branch. And as drawn, it looks like things didn't go so well. So this person had to do another commit on their feature branch. They merged back in, things went better, and then they merged up through those three, in, those three bran uh, branches back into master. So now everything went fairly well there. So what we see here is that development is wild west. That's where all the integration is going. That's where hopefully the vast majority of the broken commits will be. Then staged is this intermediate buffer with full testing. There could still be broken commits there, unfortunately, but hopefully less. And then by the time we get to master, really hopefully every single one of these commits will be uh, functional and correct. So the question is now, why do we need all of these rules? What do we get by having all these rules? And one of the things that I, can hope you, I hope that you can convince yourselves of fairly easy is every change that I end up making on master is a change that I've already made on staged, and it's also a change that I've made on, on development. So in some sense, the master branch is a subset of the staged branch, which is a subset of development. And so what this buys me is I can keep these three infinite lifetime branches from diverging too significantly, right? We keep some coherence between those three different environments. Um, yeah, and again, merge conflicts are being exposed here in development well in advance. So at this point, I can fully accept that a great many people would get very frustrated with me and they'd say, geez, you're really putting a lot of rules here. You're really killing me with your policies. Like I said, Git is really powerful. Just let me use it the way I see fit so that I can have really good individual, personal productivity. Why do I need to have these, all these rules? Like, so for instance, why can't I base my feature branches off of whatever commit I want? These are very valid uh, questions, I think. And for this particular workflow, I have uh, this particular example to understand why we might want you to always have your feature branches based off of, brand, uh, off of master. So here we have a developer who did what they were supposed to do. They have this bad idea feature branch. They do some work and merge it into development. And at this point, for whatever reason, they say, you know what, this really was a bad idea. And they don't want to do any more work on it. They want to abandon it. That code should never end up in master, right? And then there's this person who's working on some other feature that's going to take a long time. And for whatever reason, they ended up putting that on this commit in the development branch. But we know that it's not going to get into master for a while. So this person who's coming along, who's not very happy with me, they're going to say, I'm not going to create my feature branch off of master. I want to start it off of what the work, the work that this person's doing. So I'm going to put my feature branch off of there. They do three commits. They're happy. They get it all the way into master. But if we trace back from this commit on master, what we see is we pulled in that good idea. That was as intended. We also pulled in this, this, feature, uh, this feature from the commit on development. That's also as intended. However, we also pulled in that abandoned code on development. That was not as intended, right? So with the have, if we have these rules, what we're doing is we're making it so that you can go through your daily lives with the branches, make it a little bit simpler so you don't have to think about all these weird corner cases and technicalities that can come out, right? And what we're also doing uh, most fundamentally is we're isolating the master branch from the integration environment that is development. We've effectively isolated it, which is the main goal, I think, in reality. Uh, so this also motivates, unfortunately, more rules, which is development and stage should never be merged into another branch because they'll potentially end up contaminating it. So in terms of uh, you know, the workflows, the basic ones we'll go through, they're done. But I thought I would show you some particular workflows that you might find on the internet. So this one I think is from 2009. It's called Gitflow. It was uh, on Vincent Dreesen's blog. It's a really fully featured workflow. It's quite complex and it's really designed for software with official release schedules. So what we see here, for instance, is we have infinite lifetime branches in the form of master. We have it on uh, an infinite lifetime branch called develop and work is being done on feature branches, sure enough. But this particular, uh, 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 this particular workflow, you're not actually basing the, work, the, the feature branches off of master, which is where the cleanest results should be in terms of the official releases. Rather, they're basing it off of develop. And so this is one of the reasons why this workflow is sometimes criticized. But if you come up with certain rules to make sure that this development branch never deviates too significantly from master, which is what they've done, hopefully everything should go well, right? So then the next one I come across is GitHub Flow from 2011 by Scott Chacon. This is to some degree a response to the Git Flow and he says that the Git, uh, Git Flow is just far too complex. On their project they're using something called continuous deployment and continuous integration and because they work in that particular way they can get away with having a much simpler workflow. 
which is the GitHub flow. And then afterwards came the GitLab flow, and what they say is, yes, Git flow is too complex, but GitHub flow is actually, uh, it's too simple. So we've got something that adds on a little bit more complexity and makes it therefore a little bit more realistic and practical. So you can go and look up those if you want to, to see what they've had to say. So what are things that we want to think about when we're choosing a Git workflow? So again, it's about parallel development, being able to collaborate successfully through that version control system so that we're not making our lives difficult, we're not stepping on each other's toes, and most importantly, we're getting the code into the repository correctly, right? But what we want to have is a minimal set of policies that really should minimize the overheads so that they're easy to learn, they're easy to follow, and they're also easy to enforce. And then down here are some common sense advice that I found in many different places. So when you're thinking about uh, designing or adopting a Git workflow, perhaps the best thing to do is to just really sit down and honestly try to assess what is the team culture, you know, what, uh, how do the different members of that team work, and what are the projects, the challenges associated with that particular project. And then we have to honestly assess what is and isn't feasible when we try to add on more rules or more policy. And then very simply start with the simplest and add complexity only where and when necessary. So that should do it for me in terms of Git workflows. Any questions? Yes, sir. So like the workflow you showed for Flash 5, yep. um, how often do you or do you pull master into development to sort of like reseed uh, where the project Okay, so that's a, that's a really good question. I actually have a slide on that, I think. So you're saying that uh, effectively what you're saying is that sometimes someone has, let's say, a feature. So development, I don't think we ever do that. Okay. Because so far we've gotten a bit lucky. It just seems that staged and, and development have never gotten broken in any serious way, or they've never diverged too significantly. And when they have gotten lightly broken, we're able to go back and fix them up pretty, pretty easily. But what could happen, for instance, and this goes to the continuous integration that we're talking about a little bit later, is that maybe my feature branch, maybe I'm, you know, I'm, I've had this feature branch and I've been working on it for like two or three months. So by the time I'm, you know, I'm getting ready to check that into the master branch, my, 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 my branch has seriously diverged com compared to what's in the master. And so maybe what I want to do is proactively bring master in so that I can fix it up and do the integration on my feature branch, right? And get it into shape before I try to get it through into staged and, uh, and, and or development staged and master. But well, I imagine that that would also handle, right, trying to sync development. To some degree, yeah, 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 yeah. But ideally, so again, this goes back to what we're going to talk about in continuous integration. We try to keep our feature branches short-lived so that we don't have to do this sort of things. I think there are, I don't know if this is still a thing, it seems like with GitHub, when we do this, and then you try to compare branches through the web interface, um, it doesn't do a good job. It doesn't do a correct job. And it really shows you everything that's changed on commits that have nothing to do with your branch. If you do it from the terminal, it's perfectly fine. So there are subtle issues with GitHub in particular with this. Yes? Um, so I, I'm part of a team that's transitioning from uh, CVS into Git. Okay. And I'm curious if you have any recommendations. You know, when you, when you make that transition, a lot of times all the changes in the past get flattened. Okay. And so you don't really have access to what was done. So do you, do you have any tools you can recommend for like... I've done it for SVN, for SVN to Git. And if you go, I think, like to the Git SCM, the Red Book, they have suggestions. And so they might have suggestions about CVS. Mm -hmm. So there are things to be careful about. I think from SVN to Git, you end up losing perhaps uh, comments, I think, and maybe uh, like the, the, the committer's emails. Yeah. And so there are things to do. I think the, 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 you know, the best thing is make your own test CVS first and then try it on that. I, I've done that a couple times before I go and do some real serious damage. The, the CM I think it's, it's um, so if you go back to there's a link about uh, the perils of rebase. That's a, a, a particular website that has a lot of information about Git. Okay. Yeah. I think it might be called Redbook. Yeah. So if you have these not good feature branches that end up in development. Yeah. You mean like one that's been abandoned? Yeah. yeah. OK. Then effectively all of your future branches have to still integrate with that unused feature. Yeah. Does that ever get reverted out or? So that depends. Like what I was saying was, uh, for instance, 
I don't want my three infinite lifetime branches to, to diverge in a significant way. So for instance, if people have an abandoned idea, they're adding on a new facility that's not used anywhere else, that commit's just sort of innocently sitting there and it's doing no damage, right? There's no potential conflict. But if someone did some work on a real piece of the code that's already functioning, then we would need to go back and heal the development branch in a certain way, right? That's a very good question, yes. I think we had a question up here, maybe? That was actually the same question, too. Hmm? That was also my question. Same question? Yeah. OK. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, how secure is GitHub compared to, let's say, GitHub Enterprise? Because I've always been told to use you know, GitHub, my university, compared to you know, the classical GitHub. OK. You know, you could have like private folder or something like that. Unfortunately, I'm not, I, I wouldn't know, actually. Okay. I, we can open up the floor. Maybe someone else has some experience. Does anyone have an, an answer to that question? Has anyone used GitHub Enterprise? It's just who owns the servers. Yeah, yeah but that means it's more secure, basically. So. I mean, the university, yeah. in that case, yeah. owns the yeah. server that's running an instance of GitHub. Yeah. And so the university has control over it, as opposed yeah. to Microsoft. Okay. And so, so, so I, think, I think on that note, uh, GitHub, GitHub, and GitLab are all like enterprise versions for institutions. I have GitLab uh, enterprise, and their the entire service was in the campus, and they have access control for different rooms, different permissions for different versions. So we can do a lot. It has a software mm -hmm. you can, and also mostly for maintaining intellectual property and stuff like that. Okay. It's most likely what I All right. I think. Okay. Yeah. So with this workflow, it seems like it requires that you actually go through two merge stages. Yeah. So merging can be a significant amount of work, right? It can be painful, yeah. Sometimes. <laughs> so if you say if you merge into develop, you're merging with all this junk that may or may not be in stage, right? So this is a little bit what I was going with here. So if I have, I haven't really looked at this for a while, but if I have something, a conflict I think between these two, and then this one gets all the way into master, now suddenly I have conflicts between here, development, staged, and master, right? I've sort of made a nightmare scenario for myself. Is that a little bit like what you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, sort of, so since development is not sort of in line with stage, right? So, yeah. so now, now I go merge with development. And yeah. So is the idea that I merge back to my own feature branch and then merge to staged? Merge what into your feature branch? So, so when you, so I do a bunch of work, I merge into development, but that, yeah. that work is not necessarily back in my... So we wouldn't work. ever do any development directly on development or staged. We only put commits onto those two infinite lifetime branches through the merge, the merge uh, commits. Like Does that... Work in the merge. That's right, sometimes with a conflict resolution, right? Yeah, and so... Oh, I, I might have to think about this in more detail. Uh, yeah, that might be something we can talk about in the break or, or afterwards. I, 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 we might need to draw some pictures, and I don't want to say something wrong. But there are subtleties with this. And again, this goes back to the continuous integration. Um, we try to keep the feature branches as short as possible. And when we do that, we really limit the, the number of difficulties, the times that these, these pop up. Right? So that's, that's an important bit. But yeah, come and look at me. Come, come and get me afterwards, and we'll see if, we can, if I can answer your question. There's like a, that's like a simple experiment to set up, right? Like you can like quickly like set up that situation for yourself in like a new repository. Yeah. It's like it takes one second to create branches. So yeah. that might be interesting. Yeah, like all of these scenarios I did exactly that. Yeah. When I was making the slides, I made a quick little repository and tried to break things and try to fix them. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah. Yes? If a development feature or sorry, a staged feature fails its tests into master, uh -huh. is there a way to kick it off staged back to the, um, the development branch? So what we would normally do is if the commit fails on staged, then the person needs to go back to their feature branch. Uh, sorry, no, oh. if it fails on master. That hasn't happened it. yet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually been successful so far. We've been it's using this for about, I think, a year and a half or so, right? And we haven't gotten a broken commit on master. Because yeah. you might include additional testing in between the stage and master layer that you yeah. get. Actually, let me put it this way, that testing on master is a proper subset of testing on stage. So there is no way that something that passed through stage 
should fail. So staged has a larger test suite than it's on the So curiously, we set this up, and we tried to make it lightweight with the idea that people could do just manual testing on development so that they can you know, just get everything and integrate things on development as quickly as possible without having to wait for someone to validate what they did and run full test suites. But I don't think we even really need it now because people have gotten so <coughs> into the habit of just triggering an, you know, a build of the full test suite on development that we are really, I mean, we're, we're a little bit over, uh, overkill now. So, I mean, that was a happy surprise. People have really taken to uh, have this, this, this integration of testing into the workflow. Okay, I think we're probably out of time now.